Over the course of this series, we've looked at how to synthesize sound through two main signal paths. We've looked at the audio signal path, the world of oscillators, amplifiers, and filters, and how they work together and flow into each other to generate the three basic parameters of sound, pitch, amplitude, and timbre. We also looked at the modulation signal path, the world of low-frequency oscillators, envelopes, and random voltages which control those basic parameters of sound. They can even modulate each other. They can be at sub-audio rates or audio rates. All of these changes, this entire world of sound, we've explored within the discrete moment of a note. Press a key and all the modules and circuits interact to create a sound that evolved over the time of that one note. In the first lesson of this series, we looked at the oscillator from a more cosmic perspective. Use it to drive a speaker cone back and forward, and you'll create sound in the air. Slow it down and we can't perceive it as audio, but we can use it to create modulations, such as tremolo and vibrato. Slow the oscillator down even further, and it may represent a procession of notes. We can use electronics to synthesize not only sounds, but musical phrases and forms. In this, the last lesson of this series, we will look at exploring how to use the components we've become already familiar with, but on a different time scale, the time scale of musical forms and structures. This is amazing. The earliest Buchla synthesizers from the mid-1960s featured large modules called sequencers or programmers, giant banks of knobs that functioned as macro controllers. In those days, you had to record your synthesized sounds to tape and then cut the tape up and assemble discrete sounds together, which resulted in a laborious and time-consuming music-making process. The sequencer was developed to alleviate this burden. Each stage of the sequencer has three knobs that you can set to exact voltages and send anywhere in your system. In this case, row A of our sequencer is set to control the frequency of our oscillator, and row B controls the amplitude of our signal. Move to the next stage, and these parameters update to reflect the knob values of the current stage. In effect, this was the first bank of presets preset voltages that could be sent anywhere in your system to recall a distinct sound. As the 1970s transitioned into the 1980s, synthesizer technology was developing at an astounding rate. Digital components were being integrated into analog synthesizers, harnessing the power of digital storage and control with the analog synthesis engine. The Sequential Circuits Prophet 5 was the first synthesizer to include presets, which you could save and recall later. Now you wouldn't need a bank of knobs and patch cables to manage presets. A digital brain would take a snapshot of all your panel settings for you for recall later. The preset was born and suddenly you could easily and instantly switch between sounds. The digital brain of Messenger, for example, can store preset values for every single knob and switch and save those values in banks of presets. Calling up a preset means that the physical knob values no longer reflect the settings of the analog synthesis engine underneath, but rather those of the stored preset. Turn a knob and that parameter will immediately switch from the saved knob setting to the current physical setting.
Did you ever take music lessons as a child? Learning how to play an instrument requires honing many different skills at once. You of course have to learn how to physically play an instrument, but you also have to develop your internal sense of rhythm. Therefore, every music student is familiar with the metronome, a device to keep a steady tempo or steady clock for you to play against. On the synthesizer, the oscillator functions perfectly as a metronome. Set to low frequencies, it keeps steady time. A frequency of 2 Hz or 2 cycles per second corresponding to a moderate tempo of 120 beats per minute. This type of signal, a steady oscillation on the timescale of rhythm and tempo, is called a clock signal, for it keeps time within the synthesizer. We use square waves or short pulses for the clock signal, a click track ticking by at the rate of the tempo. Other timing signals in the synthesizer include the gate, which we're already familiar with, a binary signal telling us whether a key is pressed or not pressed. The length for which the gate is open is important. That tells envelope generators how long to sustain a note for. A trigger is similar to the gate in that it tells a module when an event is supposed to happen, but it doesn't contain any information about the duration of an event. A circuit that expects a trigger only cares about the rising edge, the transition from low to high voltage. If we use a clock signal to step through the stages of our sequencer, we can begin to program something like musical phrases. And we can adjust the clock rate to change its tempo. This was no new idea, of course. Go to any saloon in the Wild West and you'll find a player piano spinning a roll of perforated metal to play back a sequence of notes on the piano. Moving through the marked notes at a clock rate determined by a wound spring. Earlier musical automatons, such as the barrel organ or children's music box, also would move through note information in a method very similar to today's MIDI. Over the decades, sequencers have changed shape and interface. And while analog sequencers made of rows of knobs are still used today, sequencers take many forms, from standalone digital units to integrated subsystems within the synthesizer. Messenger has a dedicated sequencer which will move through saved note information at a steady clock rate. It takes a very different form to the bank of knobs of early sequencers, since digital memory can easily store the note information pertaining to keys as we play them. Set direction to seek and press record to begin entering notes. Press record when you're done, and press play to play back your sequence. Tempo adjusts the clock rate. The appearance of the synthesizer in the 1960s didn't just usher in a new world of sounds, but an entire new world of musical forms. The sequencer in particular ushered in countless new genres. Its cyclical cascading of melodies led to the sequencer-driven sound of bands like Tangerine Dream and Kraftwerk, while producers like Giorgio Moroder embraced its repetitive nature to bring electronics to the world of disco and dance music.
The emergence of microprocessors, while allowing for greater sequencer capabilities, also led to a new style of pattern generator called the arpeggiator. The arpeggiator allows you to hold down a chord shape and notes will play back at the clock rate. Monophonic synthesizers like the Minimoog or Messenger, which can only play one note at a time, can use the arpeggiator to sketch out chord shapes even though they can't actually play chords. The arpeggiator therefore becomes its own compositional device, its own tool for writing music and creating new patterns. Over the course of this series, we've discussed the nature of sound and how synthesizers allow us to manipulate it. The synthesizer packed an entire orchestra into a single instrument and allowed musicians to compose for a wide array of pitch ranges, timbres, and forms and to hear the results immediately, opening the gates for the individual musician to engage with the world of sound from a single machine. But beyond simply replicating existing instruments, the synthesizer created an entirely new terrain of music that no one had ever heard before. In this series, we learned how synthesizers work, how they generate tones, and how different circuits process and modify those tones. We also saw how they create modulation signals, shaping sound via the language of control voltage. And we saw how melodies and patterns can be generated with sequencers and arpeggiators. With a bit of knowledge of how synthesizers work, we can begin to transcend the limitations initially offered to us. We can take a sound that exists only in our minds and begin to manifest it. We can bend musical rules and conventions, playing directly with physics and time itself. We can twist the parameters of reality and immerse ourselves in the unexpected sounds that follow, letting our ears guide us and our minds expand in the process. As Bob once said, Everything has some consciousness, and we tap into that. It's about energy at its most basic level. Another important aspect of the sound is its envelope, how it builds up and decays as it goes on. In an analog synthesizer like this, uh, there are four parts to the envelope. The attack, which is the rise, the decay, which is the fall from the highest point, the sustain, which is how loud it is as it, as it continues, and then the release, which is how rapidly it dies to zero when you let go of the key.
no music without sound, and there's no sound without vibration in the air. While your radio or television is trying to lock on to a signal, it's always picking up noise from somewhere. And a little bit, just a tiny bit, but always there, is the sound of the Big Bang, traveling to us from the edge of the universe and the edge of time itself.